I'm Jackie Simmons, Senior Executive Editor for the Americas at Bloomberg. And joining me is Mindy Grossman, President and CEO of WW International, formerly known as Weight Watchers. So Mindy is a trailblazer in the consumer space when it comes to building and, and growing brands. She knows brands. She's worked for names from Nike to Polo, Ralph Lauren, Tommy Hilfiger, and, and many others, a real businesswoman in her own right. And, and as one of the 380 companies in the Gender Equality Index, or GI, WW has been part of this for two years. And so I thought maybe we would start there. You know, one of the metrics where WW scores highest relative to its peers in the GEI is for inclusive culture. What's inclusive culture? That's everything like initiatives, um, including benefits and parental leave. Um, Mindy, we only have your data for 2019 for that metric. So I thought maybe you could tell us a little bit about what happened in 2020, a year when benefits and flexibility and parental leave were primordial to working parents and especially for working women. Sure, Jackie, and great to be here. I think what's important is the core fundamental and acute reason that you really need to embrace diversity and inclusion at all levels of business is something that I've embraced throughout my entire career. Uh, whether it was starting Nike's first Women's Leadership Council, working on, you know, with Catalyst on inclusion surveys, or in every company that I have joined or led, making that a core fundamental foundation of what's going to create business success. And I believe that those organizations that embraced it even that much more significantly in 2020 are going to accelerate their ability to attract talent, to be able to have greater business success and to have greater innovation. And what we really did in 2020 was we invested more. Given the environment, there's nothing more important today than creating a culture that will attract talent, develop talent, and retain talent. And utilizing your listening skills to understand what's happening is really critical. But diversity is one thing, but creating a truly inclusive environment where people feel valued, where people can have, you know, you and I were talking yesterday about the expression, I like so much, you can have conversations that allow for productive discomfort because you have diversity at the table. Um, the second thing that we've been very focused on is um, diversity at the board level as well as within the organization. So if you look at our board today, um, even compared to where it was three years ago, we have six men, six women, two black women. My team is diverse. And that affects the entire organization of how inclusive people feel. And you brought up the issue that a lot of women in particular are facing um, throughout what has happened with COVID, with disruption of lives and um, families at home and kids not going to school. Um, that division of work has really become tilted. And when you look at the recent numbers of, you know, 2 million coming out of the workforce, that's a frightening statistic. And I, I think you saw the uh, other day, actually yesterday, um, I was part of a group of 50 leaders, female leaders, who wrote a, a full-page uh, letter um, in the New York Times to really talk about there truly needs to be a Marshall Plan for moms. Um, and as employers, we have to um, support, but we also need the support to come from elsewhere, or we are going to lose progress on everything we've done to ensure diversity as a core element of business success. Yeah. I mean, you kind of tipped into the next question, which, which is really about life and lockdown and all things pandemic. And, you know, the impact of COVID on women in the workforce has been, you know, a, a really harsh reality. 
um, women accounted for the vast majority of jobs lost in December. But the data also show that the impact on female jobs that were lost happened where flexibility was not possible. And so how do you think about the challenge of retaining female staff as we all hopefully get vaccinated and start heading back into offices? I think we're never going to go back to the way we used to work. At least I hope not. Um, you know, fortunately for us, we were a pretty flexible workforce organization, very Zoom, Slack. We have a lot of product tech, et cetera. Um, but we really felt that if we truly value talent and we trust talent, we have to give them the flexibility to do what they need to do as long as they feel confident in being able to do their job. And as we move forward, to your point, even with a vaccine, you know, we're going to remain a very flexible, part remote workforce, but we'll all be more purposeful when we get together. And I think, you know, giving talent the ability, right, to be able to manage what they need to do is, is part of how you build a culture that you're going to retain. Sure, but we ran a lot of headlines um, the other day, citing some uh, finance professionals, and heads of companies, and in, in the Wall Street space, saying, "You know what? The work from home is not sustainable. People need to get back into the office. They need to bump into each other at the water cooler. They need to be around other colleagues." I mean, how do you ca calibrate that? With oh, you know I, I am not saying that there is a need for interaction, right? I absolutely believe that, you know, you want to be able to get in a room, you want to be able to have those conversations, you want to be able to have those offside, you know, commentary. I think that's very important. What I'm saying is that to do that, we should be more purposeful. So think of the environment we come back to as almost part library where you come in and do your work. and part event and meeting space where you're coming together um, with, you know, a reason and a purpose to be in that in that room. And I think people really want that. They want the ability to be able to have those conversations. Got it. I mean, just um, going back to GEI for a second, I mean, your female leadership score was little changed between 2018 and 2019. You were still above average, you know, in the index. Um, but, you know, many people, we talked about this, assume a company like WW, whose business model holds a lot of appeal for women, will be, you know, naturally tapped into issues around equity, both gender and demographic. So when you think about sort of a COVID economy and how that's in exasperating inequities within demographics, including women, what are you hearing from CEOs and especially male CEOs about the urgency of narrowing that gap? So I think it's critical. And I think those CEOs, whether they be male or female, who are enlightened enough to really realize that having a diverse team is going to give you greater business success. Um, you're going to be able to have the conversations. You're going to get diverse point of views. You're going to attract more talent. All of that is critical. I think the other thing is the assumption, because you primarily service women, is you need all women, right? No, you still need diversity to get different perspectives. We're a global company. We need global diversity. We need, you know, if you think of all the elements of diversity, even of our member base, ace, age race, gender, geography, life stage, all of those things. And you want to make sure that you have a seat at the table and you're taking into consideration everything you need for your business. And I think that is really more critical today than ever. And again, I said it earlier, don't think that if you want to attract talent, that's not something that's going to be looked at in a very significant way. All right. Um, I want to talk a little bit just about, you know, again, in a COVID moment, I want to talk about uh, WW's uh, business model. Because, you know, it, COVID boosted demand for home fitness equipment and definitely fitness apps and all things digital. I admittedly have gone on to the app store on my Apple phone and downloaded a couple of fitness apps. Um, there's a lot out there. How do you, how do you stand out? Yeah, so we have been 
you know, committed. And when we came out in 2018 with, you know, our new mission and vision of truly democratizing wellness, and part of that was the significant investments in technology to have technology plus meaning help people live better connected lives and truly build an ecosystem of wellness, never abdicating our leading position in weight loss, but giving people a complete tool to help them build sustainable, healthy habits. And that is more important now than ever. And what we've seen, because we see behavior in real time, um, we see what's happening is people are doing what I call a radical reassessment of how they live, how they work, how they play, what they value, and how they spend. And health and wellness has kind of like the hierarchy of needs has elevated significantly. And people are looking for what they can trust. Um, you know, wellness is not a luxury anymore. It's a necessity. And we've certainly seen that during COVID. So for us, we've used this time to accelerate our investments and our innovation. So just in the last number of months, we launched My WW Plus, which is our newest innovation that completely personalizes your experience using AI and machine learning and marries you to an experience that's right for you. We launched Digital 360, our newest membership tier that not only provides everything and those tools, but also is on demand 24 seven coaching content built on community. And I think what people are looking for now is A, trust, B, value, but C, something that is going to be with them for their long-term journey. And we, we definitely see that's what people are looking for right now. So if you look at what we last reported, our digital business being very strong, now launching D360, and there was and still is part of our business that incorporates face-to-face -face as well. Obviously, we've had to move that to virtual workshops, and we were able to do that because of the investments we made in technology and you know, all of the innovation. Um, and to your point, people are still going to want, certain people are still going to want that face-to-face -face interaction, and we're going to be able to provide that to them. I definitely want to come back to the innovation um, and the investments, but I have a question in from the audience about some comments from our earlier part of discussion, which was about the unemployment numbers for women. Um, this person says they're devastating. What can companies do to find those women who have left the workforce in 2020 and recruit them? No, I think that's going to be very critical. And, you know, I know that I've had a number of conversations with other CEOs on, you know, how can we create forums um, to be able to identify and really understand. But I think the other thing that's important proactively is within our organizations, because, you know, we've had women leave the workforce because the workforce has narrowed, but we've also had a lot of women leave the workforce because of family issues and because not having the flexibility. So I think within our own organizations, um, we have to be proactive in being able to identify solutions, whether they be time solutions, financial solutions, support solutions, so we don't lose the talent that we need to have. Right. I mean, here's another question, just in terms of accountability, um, you know, in terms of bringing in diverse talent and more women. When you, when you have exchanges like, you know, NASDAQ, which are proposing uh, to hold companies account in order to do business with them, um, you know, my question is, is, is that the role of the exchanges or should companies be doing something differently themselves to find ways to hold each other to account? So my answer is both, right? I think um, I'm a big fan of what Adina did. And, you know, obviously our board reflects that. But, you know, I do think that you have to be very purposeful and measurable. Uh, so, for example, when I was at Nike and we really had to identify how could we have greater gender representation. We did an inclusion survey, identified how we had to bring women together, but we also put in place, you could not fill 
an open position unless 50% of the qualified candidate pool was diverse. And then you had to hire, and then you had to measure, and then you had to incentivize your leadership on the diversity of their pipeline. And if it doesn't come from the CEO, it is not going to be embedded into the culture. And inclusion is a skill. And you, yes, you can have diversity, but you also have to work just as hard at inclusion. And so your board has to reflect that, your leadership team has to reflect that, and your culture has to reflect that. That 50, real quick, that 50%, uh, you know, candidate pool rule that you developed, you know, d decades ago, is that something you use today within WW? Yeah, we, we ensure diverse pools for all our roles. And, you know, it's just, it's our way of doing business, right? So, um, you know, it's embedded throughout the organization, which is how leadership is, you know, measured and how it's embraced. And I think it's of critical importance. So, you know, with a few minutes we have left, I said I wanted to come back to the innovations and new products, um, you know, which you talked about uh, that, you know, spelled out nicely. But when you think about innovations and new products, are there opportunities, new opportunities in 2021 to partner with other firms in the wellness space or even buy, you know, a rival in the digital, you know, product uh, area? So I'm a, I'm a very big fan of partnerships, authentic partnerships where together you're going to create greater impact than if you did it on your own. A great recent example is we announced, uh, Sharon Lighty, who's the CEO, and I uh, announced a partnership with Vitamin Shop. And it's not just a product partnership, but it's product experiences uh, within their retail formats. And she's also partnered with us as part of the Healthy Living Coalition, where there's now 20 businesses in both the public and private sector that are really committed to closing the real disparity gap between access to healthy food. So around advocacy, action, and investment. So, you know, she and I like to say a great partnership is authentic and one plus one equals 10 if you can identify what you can really do together to have impact. And so, you know, we look for those opportunities to be able to partner and to your earlier point, at times acquire businesses that are going to help us accelerate our efforts. Is there anything specific you're thinking about, uh, you know, in the next sort of 12 months? Well, we're very focused right now on the diabetes space. Um, we just brought in Dr. Adam Kaufman as our head of diabetes. Um, you know, we have a big focus on our new membership verticals to be able to provide more support and a very big focus on personalization um, and really being able to make every journey individual to the unique person. And when we look forward to more announcements there, I mean, really with just a, a minute and a half left, I mean, I, I want to quickly ask you about your subscriber numbers because they looked really good in Q3. You also added higher margin digital products. Revenue contracted. Some of that, I think, was probably owed to the studio business. You know, very quickly, right. can you tell us a little bit about what that business is for people who aren't familiar and what's the outlook for stu the studio activity? Sure. Well, you know, as, as, as you saw at the end of Q3, obviously, with our, our studios uh, closed and that being, a, you know, higher business, there was some revenue pressure. Um, but we were thrilled to end the quarter with 60% gross margins because of the high margins of our digital business and now D360 and what that flow through was. So we will continue, um, you know, with a lot of the closures to, you know, just be able to maximize our digital platforms, um, but really continue to be able to build our subscriber base as effectively as possible. I would be irresponsible to not ask the question about Oprah. I mean, one of the more prominent voices, uh, not only for the firm and face of the firm, but she's on your board, an investor. Can you just tell us in the last 30 seconds, what can we expect um, from her contribution to WW in 2021? 
Look, Oprah's been an incredible partner to me and to the organization, and she's a great example of kind of ultimate discretion and what she puts herself towards. I think everybody knows we did that incredible tour uh, with Oprah at the beginning of 2020, nine cities in, you know, nine weeks. And then we also launched a significant virtual tour because right now galvanizing people to do the best for themselves is important. So um, look for things to come from us with Oprah.